so yeah yep. okay so here we go it's been a while and welcome everyone um to the very first learn the birds webinar for 2022 and we don't have one presented today we have quite quite a few right so you've been speaking with us for a little bit um and we'll all we'll all introduce ourselves right um but it's five of us here right now we have um chris Terrells and lynette rudman who have joined the team and uh, because from last year you would know dr derek keats etienne marie and myself faraz abdul right um so yeah so just um because we've been a little bit out out of the loop um maybe maybe derek you can just touch on what's what we're going to be looking at for 2022? Yeah, so we've just got uh, uh, four quick slides just to talk about what's coming up on Learn the Birds. But, uh, but uh, first of all, as Farad uh, said, you know, we are two, two, two new people this, uh, this time around. Well, not new people, because you may have seen Krista before. She did a, a, a webinar, and Lynette has done a webinar, two webinars, mm -hmm. and um, a couple of, of articles on, on our blog as well. Um, and um, so, but la now last year, what we did is we had a webinar every week. Um, and as the person who did most of the organizing of the webinars, that was very taxing on me. And what it meant is that the rest of the site got neglected and, and all the things that I was, you know, that we were planning to do uh, last year didn't didn't get done. So what's coming up this year in terms of the webinars? First of all, we're changing from one webinar a week to one webinar a month, um, which will be on the third Thursday of the month, which is what this Thursday is, I think. And um, that's not to say that we will only have one webinar in a month, but that's what we will commit to. And uh, the exception is March. Um, you probably will remember from uh, last year um, that I'm quite passionate about showcasing the role of women in, in birding and ornithology. And March uh, being the month that has uh, Women's Day, International Women's Day, um, is a good, seems like a good month to, to celebrate women in birding and ornithology. So we're lining up webinars for every week during March. Um, we haven't posted any yet because we're still shuffling things around and finding dates and somebody can't make this date and someone else can't make that date. And so we have to trade. And so there's a little bit of negotiation still going on there, but we will, we will have uh, those webinars listed on the, on the website soon. Mm -hmm. um, of course, just to, just to interject here, if any of one, if, if anyone who is, who is looking right now, just, you know, you might know someone who might know someone who might be interested in speaking, just let us know. Indeed, or is interested in introducing someone who, who might want to be a speaker. Um, you know, it, it's uh, people do come up uh, um, sometimes by accident. And I had a really in, amazing conversation uh, last night with a, with a Nigerian uh, professor living in the Yukon territories of Canada, where it was minus 40 something yesterday. Um, and uh, he's got some really, really good stories to, to tell. So you never know where someone's uh, going to uh, pop up and, and be a really excellent speaker. And they may not fit for the third Thursday, in which case we will make another uh, webinar during that month. So it means you still have to keep your eye on Learn the Birds. And for us, of course, you're going to continue with Bird is a Word, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, but not this month, because um, the last Friday of this month, I'll be on I'm doing a birding trip, so I have some people coming in. It's going to be our very first birding trip. Um, well, I guess international foreign guests since the start of the pandemic. So the last time I was booked for a trip was in March 2020, and then that person had to fly out on an emergency basis because of what was going on. And then we had absolutely nothing. So this time, this the, the end of this month is going to be the first uh, birding trip. Um, that well, reading. that's cool. We, we will after, definitely not stand in the way of that. And I'm sure you'll have some interesting things to tell us when you get back anyway. Yeah, of so, course. But after we're looking at starting in February and, and going on. 
Yeah. And and those bird is the word sessions are really cool. This is it, this is kind of a little bit based on on the bird is the word session, but probably with more people than we no, normally have in it. So um, what is coming up in terms of the site? So you probably know that I'm I'm uh, uh, an ex professor of biology, but and and a, and a mad keen birder, but I'm also a geek. So I spend quite a bit of time on the technology that runs the Learn the Bird site. And um, so one of the things that we've we've looked at uh, last year as a team is, you know, how do we how do we find a way to create sustainability for Learn the Birds so that you know that it can continue to exist and continue to grow and be a really great place for people to go and learn about the birds. Um, and one of the, the ways that, um, that one of the things that people use to, 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 to do that is to create membership and to have sort of, let's call it premium content for, for members. Um, and, and that that's proven to be popular and, uh, uh, so we're going to give it a try. I hope that it will work. Um, we'll have two levels of membership. Some of you may have registered on the site already um, and found that you can register now as a free falcon. Uh, and that's the free membership. Uh, anybody can register there and you will always have access to all of the, the free things and some additional content that you will only get if you are a free member as opposed to just a general public coming in and looking. Um, then uh, we will have another level of membership and we haven't finalized all of this yet. So it's not switched on. It's all set up on the site and is ready to go. Um, I, I've been calling it Golden Gannet, uh, but I put a question mark there. If anybody's got a better name for it, very happy to uh, to, to give it a try. Etienne, you had an, another uh, possible name for it. What was it? Golden? It was the Precious Putter. Precious, precious pitta. Yes. Precious pitta, yeah. <laughs> because I love pitta. Yeah, exactly. I've seen lots of them. So, yeah. And it's yeah. one of those so, iconic birds. So jewel. I think that might be a that might be a better one. So maybe we will call it that. But there will be another level of oh, um, oh, premium pitta. I like precious. Oh, platinum. Yeah, I like precious too. Yeah. Premium. Well, Carolina yeah, premium, premium pitta. Is good. <laughs> okay, premium pitta. It's a, it's a it's a compromise, right? <laughs> um, and and uh, so we will have so the idea there is uh, is something that I'll expand on in another slide. Or actually, it's in this slide. So let me just get to the next uh, um, uh, thing, which is interactivity and social aspects of the site. Yeah. So we've I'll had go. this. Uh, no, no, no. Go back. Oops. <laughs> Uh, uh, it, we've had this capability for for quite some time, but we've not used it for for anything. Um, and so, what we what we intend to do is to make use of the forums, uh, um, messaging capabilities, and allow for activities to happen on the site. So, I'll, I'll give you an example of some of those activities that might be available. For example, as as a, a premium PITA member. Um, so we might, for example, set up a, a community area to do with photography. And, uh, and, and this is now me off the top of my head talking. So my colleagues probably haven't heard me say this before. So, uh, but this is just, you know, some, some of the potential ways in which we could do it. So let's say we have a, an area, uh, you know, a community area uh, uh, to do with photography. So we can put up videos, we can put up, uh, we can share, you know, good sites where people can learn about photography. Um, you know, uh, we can have question and answer sessions, we can have forums, we can actually have online activities. Um, we can have sort of a asynchronous um, webinars in a way where you can interact uh, with a video but over time instead of all at, all at once. So there's a lot of stuff like that that we can do. And we can do those on any topic. It might be Lynette, as an example, is, uh, is, is really keen on, on uh, sound recording. So it might be a, a thing to have a, um, a little community area, uh, you know, dealing with sound and, and recording, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the kinds of things that we see um, the, the membership areas is, is having. And and uh, Krista, you had some uh, ideas there as well. Do you want to speak to them around how we could, you know, what what premium uh, uh, membership might entail? Or have I put you on the spot? 
No, no. So, uh, yeah, I think um, being able to have more comprehensive um, forums for topics of discussion uh, where we're kind of going in with you know mini webinars, almost getting more in depth into particular uh, topics of interest where at the end people are able to ask further questions and kind of pick pick our brains and and have a sense of community with other people um, about tips and tricks and other things that they're able to pick up. Um, also having the opportunity to send out uh, PDF guides and um, other sorts of resources that people are able to use in their own birding endeavors that you know we will provide templates for. Um, and, you know, if there are particular things that you have questions about that you want um, more in-depth knowledge about, those are things that we're able to put together and, and sort of provide for that, that community. So those are just a couple of the things that we've, we've thought about providing as well. So now given that, uh, you know, we are adding capability to the site and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully I'll have a little more time this year to work on it. Um, you know, please suggest anything that you would like to see added, you know, whether it's uh, it's it's particular kinds of content or particular kinds of activities or uh, so just, you know, please just let us know you you know how to reach us now. I think most people here know how to send an email to either Derek had learned the birds or Chris had learned the birds or uh, Faraz had learned the birds or used the uh, the uh, uh, the comments uh, uh, link on the on the on the bottom of the website. So we can go to the next one, I think. Yeah, I mean, um, however you think that we can, as a community, help your, uh, help everyone become better birders and better able to enjoy the birds, do let us know. Yeah, so this is um, another area is, is in, you know, increasing uh, the, the, the kinds of activities that we have and the content that we have available. So online courses is one example of that. Um, and Krista is actually working on an online course at the moment, um, and uh, and that will be available sometime soon. Uh, master classes is another one. Now we've done master classes as if they were webinars in the past, um, but they were never really recorded and and available um, afterwards. And lots of people have uh, have asked for that, and we've kind of you know made the recording available. And if you make a donation and I give the donation to the speaker, it's all very, you know, weird. Um, and, and that's not very sensible. And also having the masterclasses on the webinar platform meant that I had to spend time manually approving every webinar registration. And that like, you know, for that could take me uh, two hours a week uh, just doing that. Um, so I've turned that, uh, that off because what we're going to do this year is the master classes will be part of the courses and they will therefore persist after the actual master class has been run and somebody else who comes along and wants to register for that master class can still register for it, even though it won't be live, it'll be asynchronous. And then um, also we, we will try and start uh, getting more articles up. Um, you know what the, you know the, it's a blog but uh, we like to think of it as as articles uh, as a kind of magazine sort of style um interface and the, the that cap that functionality has been there but it's been bog standard out of the box ugly uh for for since since learn the birds started because we jumped in to do the webinars and we didn't really focus on much else so i will be spending some time updating that and we hope to be able to have more articles and also you know if anybody wants to write something put it up there you're welcome to you know it can be a little birding thing like i did if you look at the at the website you will see that i did a little birding thing about uh, um, about the um uh, the oxpeckers on the buffalo you know and uh, and that's uh, uh, that's that's something that anybody could do anybody who's a birder who makes an observation uh, it doesn't have to be new, new to science. It can be something which helps people to learn. And then digital downloads. Uh, this is another area that uh, we want to explore. We, we haven't uh, spent a lot of time on it, uh, thinking about what would be in there. Um, but, you know, this could be things like um, how to find, a, you know, a rarities, or it could be how to find uh, a particular bird that's only found within a certain localized region, 
there's lots of uh, things that could be in these digital downloads. It's a, a tips uh, on, on, you know. So those are some of the things that we, we want to add, have on the site and that we'll be working on this year. And some of those, and anything that is a, um, um, you know, that has a cost to it, if, if the person is a, a member uh, of the, what did we call it? Pressure, uh, um, something pizza. Oh, um, the pizza one. Work in progress. Which, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Premium option. Premium pizza, yes. Premium pizza. Um, although it does sound a little bit like Emirates Airline, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> about golden eagle um somebody suggested golden eagle anyway let's not worry about what it's called but the the premium uh <laughs> members will get discounts on anything that has costs yeah, associated. that's a kind of rabbit hole yeah or let's go to the next one. Oh, does anybody want to add anything here you guys sorry i'm being i'm monopolizing here i shouldn't do that <laughs> uh, i think um just just to, again put, putting it out there um that if you have anything that you want to add, if you if you want to see something, if you have an idea that you think, hey, you guys at Learn the Birds can do something like this, I think it'll be great. Just um, shoot us an email, uh, shoot us a message and let us know. Okay, so we're taking long on this and it should have only been 10 minutes. So let's let's quickly go. I think this is the last one. No, there's one more, I think. Yeah, it's it's been it's been more than 10 minutes, but um but time flies when you're having fun, right? So, okay, yeah. that's that's so do you want to move over to these uh, birding holiday trips uh, or, yeah, or so equivalent? I think, I think that's what that's what we all uh, kind of came here for. Um, if if anyone has any questions on what we spoke about just now, just put it put it in the chat, and we'll get to it at some point in time. So yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'm starting, am I? Well, I think this was yeah. Let's let's start with with at the end then. That was a map that was supposed to be for you, but it got misplaced. But okay, we can go back to it after. Yeah, Thank we... you for that, um, Ross and, and Derek. I'm just going to kick off on the discussion on holiday birding. Yeah, because, uh, and then talk about my own holidays. Kai Mouth, which is on the southeastern coast of South Africa, is a place that uh, I've been on holiday with my, with, uh, with my wife and family for 26 years. I live up in Pretoria, so it's about... Um, 1100 kilometers away and ever since i've been going there as a professional bird guide a keen birder what do you do when you go on holiday you go birding and in particular i think uh, the, you bird with purpose you bird in terms of a game and the purpose and the game i think are beautifully combined uh, we've popped back to area um, to Derek's yeah, sorry. Side, are beautifully combined if you do citizen science and um, viewers will know about eBird, which we participate in. But in South Africa, I think we're very supportive of the South Afri Southern African Bird Atlas Project, which is a project to, to map the distribution of birds across the region. And what you have on the left there is the Kaimouth Ferry, which is one of only three motor ferries uh, where you have can only, only way to get over the river is by boat. And on the, on, the, uh, on the right of the screen is my bird lasso screen grab from uh, the card. So you basically go out and you walk around the pentad. In this case, I walked about 60 kilometers in five days all over that pentad. And it's a lovely area. It's a combination of beaches. People go deep sea fishing. People play golf. Uh, there's a golf, golf um, course right in the middle there. There's a nature reserve. People go hiking. Morgan's Bay's got nice restaurants. But it's got fabulous habitats and by walking around you can get to all these habitats and you can find in this case of the 171 species so the pentad is a five minute by five minute block and this particular pentad's name is 32402820 and so far citizen scientists have contributed 260 cards almost all of them in the form of holiday birding. People go there on holiday and they go birding and they submit their data. And 305 species have been recorded in the Pentad, which is only about uh, nine kilometers by nine kilometers uh, square and a lot of it's ocean. My personal tally there is through the 32 cards and 262 species. So what happens when you do this? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is fascinating. 
the Pentad, this area is like my second home patch. I live in Pretoria, but I go there on holiday. I got to know it and I try and find new birds. I observe the change in the seasons, what birds are found at different times of year and how the, the, the particular rainfall or temperature or whatever it is or weather patterns influence the birds in the area. I think the next slide, Faraz, if anyone wants to chip in there. And, and, and you know, the thing, the thing with, with working a home, a home patch, as it's known around the world, is that you, you tend, if you work it repeatedly and you work, you go to a place and you bird it regularly, you see all the common birds. But occasionally, just because you're out in the field, you bump into something extraordinary. And in this case, on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas uh, 2018, out of the ocean came a white tern, Gigas alba. Now, this is to date the only record for Africa, the African continent. And also, this is the only photograph ever taken of white tern on the African continent. So this is extraordinary uh, good luck, I suppose. But also, you only have luck if you spend time in the field. And what I like about this photograph, it's not a great photograph, it's not going to win any competitions, but the two black birds in the center are African oyster catchers. So you've got the white tern above and the African oyster catchers. And, you know, they are species which occupy different parts of the globe. And here they are on the same photograph. So that was something special. Um, next photo, uh, next slide for Roz. And then this uh, recent uh, visit, I've just come back um, just uh, on, on, in fact, on New Year's Day. Uh, I didn't manage to take a photograph because I forgot my bridge camera when I went out walking. So I posted, I put up here a photograph by Albert McLean, uh, a birding client of mine. We were at the mouth of the Orange River in South Africa. That's on the West Coast on, on, in March of 2021. And lo and behold, there were all these dummer returns. Now, dummer return is an endangered species. There's probably only 50 to 60 pairs in South Africa. The bulk of the world's population is in Namibia to the north uh, of us. And um, the bird on the right is a, is a juvenile recently fledged. You can see the sort of uh, brownish crown. And they were actually being fed here. And this was a remarkable experience because in this on this sandbar, we've, we've counted 44 dummer returns, which is, you know, literally 80% or more of the South, a whole South African population on one sandbar. Okay, so the question is where the turns go. And I think that uh, just to speak to the last image, um, that's the dummer returns global <coughs> distribution. And you might ask, what's this got to do with holiday birding? Well, the fact is I've, I managed to find uh, uh, on this current holiday, two adult dummer returns feeding a very similar juvenile to that last image at Kai Mouth, which is just to the north. If you look at South Africa, and you see the green bit of, that's the summer breeding, uh, southern summer breeding distribution, just to the north. And there were uh, two adults <coughs> feeding a youngster outside of this range, more towards the east coast and Madagascar. And this is remarkable because it poses the question, uh, have they changed their breeding range? Or are these birds, in fact, on their way up the east coast of Africa? Because a recent discovery, which I've been part of, and I've been lucky to see them there, is that, that um, the San Sebastian Peninsula, which is a lovely subtropical coastal paradise or on the Mozambique coast, in um, May this year, I was fortunate enough to count and submit to eBird uh, an, a, a total of 106 Dharma returns. That's, uh, this is the uh, BirdLife International map. It's not even recorded for Mozambique, and yet there were 106. So holiday birding here has played a role, hopefully, uh, in, in helping to uncover what are the movements of these birds. And I think for those of our friends from around the world, one of the things we need to understand about Africa is that we are very data deficient. There's so much we don't know about our bird life. Uh, so for me to go on holiday, there's no greater joy to just go out and do citizen science, to do eBird, to do SABAP. And you always find some. You always find a rarity or you always find something extraordinary that, uh, that 
fills in a piece of a puzzle. Uh, and that to me is just just wonderful. Um, and there's, you know, one is doing it freely at, in one's, at one's own pace, uh, on holiday with family. They might be on the beach or playing golf, but I'm out looking for something interesting. And that's the nature of birding, isn't it? Birding is about fascination of yeah. what is going on in the natural world around us. So I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in. There yeah, at... it's uh, fabulous. Um, I don't know how any of us are going to come close to this kind of monumental kind of sighting that you've had. You know, I'm just going back to the picture of the, the white tun and you're seeing the, the African oyster catcher. And that is exactly what you need that that in a in a in a photograph um that that's different from every other photograph of either of those two species you'll never find them together as you said it's crazy um as as you're talking there we're talking about ebird there's a bird that's calling outside i don't know if you all are hearing it um it's a southern beardless terranulate and it's a very tiny flycatcher and we have I've, I've hardly ever seen that bird um, at home. And I'm looking out of my window right now and I'm seeing it. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you all. Anyway, um, I think let's uh, let's move on to Derek. I think you were, you were gonna go up next, talk about your, your map. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're, we're talking about holiday birding and I think my perspective is a little different from, uh, from Etienne's. Um, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't recognize a rarity if it hit me in the face. Um, you know, I'm. I'm more interested in the behavior of the birds, what they're doing, how they came to be, how they act, how they interact um, with the environment, with the ecosystem, and how they evolved. What are the characteristics um, that they display, and how far back in evolution did those characteristics evolve, and did they just evolve once, or are they? You know, it's all of those sorts of things. And um, since I live in, in Hoodsprite, which is um, kind of about halfway up the top part of uh, the, the map of Limpopo, on the right there of Limpopo, um, I, I went to what I call the Northern Parks. So it's uh, Mapungubwe National Park, um, which is the, 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 uh, the map pin there on the top left and uh, the northern part of Kruger National Park, which is the map pin there on, on the right. And for those who don't un understand the scale of Kruger National Park, Kruger National Park and Gonorezo and uh, the Great Limpopo uh, Park in, in Mozambique, the three of them together make up a transfrontier um, uh, uh, a park that is roughly about the size of Wales or Belgium. So this is not a, not a small area. So if you look at the other map, the map on the left, you can see that um, um, uh, uh, Mapungubwe is where Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, and South Africa uh, meet up. And the Northern Kruger is where um, uh, Z uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and South Africa uh, meet up. So there's three countries coming together in each of those, each of those corners. So if we go to the next one. So... I was just on holiday and it was just me and my camera. I was by myself. I was camping uh, for, for uh, 16 days. And um, what happened there? Um, the, um, um, so, the, so one of the things that I, I, I think that we under, undervalue or underestimate is the knowledge of the people that look after the campsites and the camps in, in our national parks. Um, so I uh, went to Mapungubwe, I went to the campsite, I set up my tent, and the next day, um, the, the, the man was coming to clean the garbage, and he says, hey, by the way, did you see the European nightjar over your head there? And sure enough, above my head was a European nightjar. Um, and this is this is very typical of uh, of this bird. It's uh, when it's in its uh, uh, this part of the world in the daytime, um, but it you know its distribution is across Europe all the way across to Mongolia, and then they kind of come together and they come down into sub-Saharan Africa for uh, the northern winter or our summer. Um, and and uh, so this bird was sitting literally right above right above. Uh, 
right about where I get out of my car when I park my car by the tent, actually. Uh, and uh, once you've seen it, now you'll, you'll, you will never forget it and you will see it again. So it's a little bit like the effects that, uh, that Lynette was talking about, but it's, it's, it's different because it's, it's about recognizing an individual species that you probably would not have noticed uh, if you didn't, if someone didn't point it out for you. So this bird was here on this branch and uh, it would get up and it would sort of slowly turn around and sort of blink its eye the next slide. And, and you know, maybe um, the next slide for us and maybe have a yawn and then go back to sleep on the branch again. And what's interesting about this bird to me is, um, I mean, night jars are interesting anyway, but this one, this particular one was, was interesting because it seems to have an incredible ability or fidelity for a resting spot. So in, I was there for four days and on the second day, it, um, it left um, at about, 10 minutes to seven in the evening. And when I left to go out uh, birding the next morning at about uh, uh, 20 minutes past four, it was not back yet. But when I came back, it was back and it was sitting in the same spot by that same little little knob there. Um, and the, the following day, uh, same story, uh, but it went, it went onto another branch in the tree but it rained and then it, it flew somewhere and then it came around and it landed back on the same spot again. So the four days that I was, uh, that I saw this bird, that I was there, it actually every morning came back to exactly the same spot on the tree. And this is something that they apparently are, are quite known for that they will come back to the same tree and often to the same, um, 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 to the same uh, spot on the same branch of the tree, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, I, so this is this is a shout out for me to the to the to the campground attendants, the un, underappreciated uh, people that uh, that look after our campsites and and that know so much about the nature there that we often don't realize. You know. Okay, so over to the next one. Lynette, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Um, I didn't go very far this holiday because of the COVID restrictions and such. And one of my daughters had COVID here at home. But anyway, um, she's fine. Um, I did do some local birding and I discovered this green woody poo nest. Now, um, you'll see from this video when it starts playing that there are two holes. There's one lower down between the branches and one top left. Um, there seem to be chicks in both holes and there were three adult birds feeding chicks in both holes. Often I'd find one bird um, going to the bottom hole and not finding the chick and then going and feeding the top one. So I think maybe those two holes are linked. I don't know what other explanation there would be unless there were two females and they you know laid eggs in two separate holes and because wood hoopoos um have like last year's chicks that help to feed you know the new chicks so they have helpers so yeah you, know, you you can play the video The adult fed it a huge spider that took it about five minutes to actually swallow. Was that a berry? It looked like a berry. I'm not sure. Um, there were a lot of insects, different types of insects and uh, being fed and huge spiders. And um, they kept bringing these massive ones that the, I think were far too big for the chicks to actually swallow, but they uh, must have kept them um, full for quite a long time. Thanks for us, you can go on to the next one.
the video is really beautiful in it. I like Thank that, you. being able to, to see them in the nest. Mm -hmm. uh, so often in the winter, uh, one of the things, you know, there's a couple of different ways I think that we can, we can go out birding. And I love some of the uh, examples that we've already had so far of, you know, citizen science birding and then uh, choosing a specific location to go birding. And sometimes there's even, you know, opportunities to uh, visit and experience birds as sort of an experiential sort of thing, where if there's a certain um, uh, event that you're interested in seeing. So that's why I wanted to show uh, actually being able to uh, go out and see snow geese. And in I'm, I'm in California and in, in Northern California, just north of Sacramento, uh, which is about an hour north of San Francisco, just for reference. And uh, in the winter time, we get just so many snow geese coming in. It's incredible. Um, just hundreds and hundreds of them in the wetlands and agricultural fields. And they'll winter around here as well as up into Oregon and uh, some parts of Washington state and, and Southern British Columbia. Um, and um, Faraz, if you could just go to the next next one so we can have a little clearer image. Um, you can see during the day, uh, these birds will uh, flock together to wetlands and, and other um, grassy areas, agricultural areas to forage together. Uh, but sort of the spectacle that is really fun to see is uh, at, at dawn and dusk when they're leaving their roost site where they spend the night to all blast off at one time to go to their foraging site or when they're leaving their foraging site to all blast off together to go to their roosting site where they're gonna spend the rest of the night. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what I did um, up at Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge was where these photos were taken was just to go up and just have that experience of being able to be there at sunset and see all of these birds um, sort of lift off at, at one time. And, um, you know, it's so cool. I think in the in the winter, a lot of times, it, uh, you know, in in the um, in the area where we are, where it can be, you know, pretty, pretty cold. I know that there are a lot of other people who came on who are saying that, you know, they're from um, North America and some parts of Europe where it's pretty frigid right now. You know, a lot of times things can feel really quiet in the winter time, but, um, you know, and, and not not really like there's a whole lot of stuff going on in, in certain areas. It's not as birdy and chirpy and, and vibrant um, as it might be maybe sometimes in the migration seasons. But, you know, in the winter, it can be such an interesting time of year to find spots like this where you can go out and go birding, where it's just teeming, uh, teeming with birds and, and teeming with life, um, you know, it, even in the, even in the middle of winter like this. So uh, I, being able to go out and, and see all the snow geese lift off like that was just so cool. And if you have a, a refuge or a park that's near you, that has wetlands um, or agricultural areas nearby, it's likely that you've got waterfowl, uh, or other kinds of water birds that are doing the same kind of behavior in the evenings and doing that lift off um, where you can go and, and see them at, at sunset all, all kind of come up at one time, which makes for cool photographic opportunities, but also is just a neat, a neat sort of birdie thing to go and experience and see at some point. Uh, so anytime, anytime you have that kind of habitat near you, check, check it out and look on eBird at, at those hotspot locations at, at nearby wetlands uh, to see how many birds have been potentially recorded there. I know um, when we went this one day to Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge and we were uh, seeing the snow geese, there are hundreds of them um, that in, in one location that other people were reporting at at one time. Um, so, yeah, that's that's one of my one of my favorite things to do as far as winter birding goes to see all all of these birds kind of in one place at the time at the same time, and um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And the snow good. geese are pretty uh, are pretty amazing uh, and interesting birds because they have this uh, this migration in very very large numbers. I've 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 seen them migrating in in Quebec. Um, on the on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River um, and uh, when they're going north in the spring and uh, you get like a hundred thousand of them flying over your head. It's pretty amazing. 
Yeah, and they're incredible. Is it, is it that, you know, like I'm looking at this picture here and I'm seeing that their, um, their legs are just tucked in into their feathers. Is that also yeah. like an uh, adaptation for the cold as well? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Do y'all know? I don't know. Mm. If anyone knows, let us know. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I, I don't that. know. I found that really a nice uh, example of holiday birding where you go out to see some spectacle involving the bird's life cycle um, at a specific time of year. And if I can just share one example we have in South Africa in the winter months. In the summer months, the blue cranes, which is our national bird, they're in pairs and they scattered out over the grasslands and little uh, depressions where they breed. But in the winter months, they all get together in these big flocks. And, you know, when you talk about sunsets or sunrises, there's nothing more spectacular than being out on the South African high fell in the early, early, early um, morning or the late evening and having huge numbers of blue cranes coming in to roost on a lake. And the sound and it's cold and you've got a jacket on, you might have coffee or uh, a sundowner drink, you know, and it's just the whole experience of seeing masses of birds. Uh, beautiful birds and the sounds and the whole the whole atmosphere of it is just wonderful. Yeah, I mean, like I've never experienced such great numbers of of big birds, but you know, like to experience a murmuration of let's say we have the sizzle here that come ever so often, and I know, like in Europe, you have the starlings, the starling murmuration and whatever, um, and small birds in such large number is so. Um, it's so mind blowing. I can, it's I can hardly imagine how it will be to have these huge birds in huge numbers. It, it's something that you don't need binoculars or you don't need a telephoto lens to experience. It's just something that you can be present for and, and, and leave with your mouth open. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the one of the things that I really like about the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge too actually is um, it has an auto route that you can go on. So you essentially stay in your vehicle a lot of the time. So you can kind of go around this auto, it's a loop. And then there's specific pull off sites where you can then kind of get out and, and check with your binoculars. Oh. But then this way, uh, the birds aren't, you know, um, lifting off too early too, because everyone's sort of staying in their vehicle waiting for that critical moment in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, you know, these these kinds of locations are really great too, as far as accessibility goes. So if you uh, look up other refuges that or parks and whatnot that have these kinds of auto routes, where you know there's specific birding locations that you can stop on along the way, it, it helps um, also if if you're um, concerned about uh, accessibility and you want to be able to use your vehicle to get around to bird. Excellent. Yeah, the place. I think it's your turn for us in the bucket list yeah by elimination it is my turn <laughs> so um yeah so i'll just talk uh, very briefly about this um single species bay breasted wobbler um that i had seen previously maybe like once or twice like very very high up in a tree just in the canopy you know you get wobbler neck from looking at these things right i don't know if it, if it happens uh in south africa but we were always just looking up like that and we have all our binoculars and uh, before you know it your neck is hurting you anyway um one afternoon we were just i just had lunch and i put down i put down my plate and i was just looking outside there was a shower of rain coming in and it was it was about mid-afternoon and the sun was was lovely it was just kind of filtered by some clouds the rain was coming down and it was just looking so beautiful. It was backlit and everything. And then the rain just, it didn't last for too long, maybe a couple of minutes. And then it stopped. So some birds came out to feed and I saw this bird feeding on our front fence. And I'm thinking, but this is not anything like what I'm accustomed to among our usual backyard birds or front yard birds or whatever. And I'm staring at it. And I don't want to leave the window to get my binoculars in case it leaves and I don't get a seat again. So I'm trying my best to figure out exactly what this bird is. I'm like, okay, it's got a dark back. It's kind of yellow, yellow front and so on. 
And then I, I just like eventually decide, hey, what? I have to risk it. I just get up, run down the corridor to get my, my bins, come back. It's not there, run outside. And it, essentially a lot of frantic, frantic running up and down. Um, startled my wife, startled the cat. Everyone is just wondering what's going on, but everyone knew, well, it has to be something to do with some kind of bird. And I'm just yelling, it's a bee-breasted warbler. I'm not sure, but it might be a bee-breasted. It might be a black pole. I wasn't sure. Eventually, I found it on this plant, which is also in our yard, which is, which is a, um, a huge pink um, bougainvillea. And it was just there. It was just sitting down there, and it was preening, and it was just enjoying itself. Um, and I got my camera, got a few pictures, and uh, yeah, that was that was my story. That was maybe in that was in late November or early December. I think it it was in early December. And um, yeah, it's it's the second time I believe I've seen this bird, but the first time that I've seen it so absolutely um, clear. And you know, it wasn't hopping around. I didn't have to work really hard. I was I was wearing flip flops. That's a kind of that's the kind of holiday, holiday building that I, I really enjoy. So over to it's you, Derek. For us Thank too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think we all as, as birders have a boogie bird that uh, we try and try and try and try and get. And, and, and it's not that necessarily that uncommon, um, but somehow or the other we miss it. And um, the great spotted cuckoo has been my photograph, phot photography boogie bird for a while. Um, I've seen it, but uh, never managed to get it, get a picture of it. Uh, not even a far away picture, not even a bad picture. And um, so I would, in, in Mapungubwe, um, I was just driving around uh, randomly looking at birds. Mapungubwe drips with birds. I've, uh, there's nowhere that I have been birding in, in, in South Africa that has so many birds per square meter as, as Mapungubwe does. They are just birds everywhere. Um, it, it, you, you, you just cannot turn and look in any direction and not see birds. Uh, literally, it's, 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 it's amazing. And, and this is particularly true of the western side of the park where the campsite is. So I was driving along and I just heard this call. And I immediately, I knew it was a great spotted cuckoo. And I just looked and I said, where's the heck? Where's this bird? Where's this bird? And then I look out the window and it's actually flying along beside me. And it landed in, in this tree. And I was so excited to get a picture, even though it was a bit far away. Uh, so I just stopped. And um, the next uh, uh, slide uh, for us. And, and it just uh, flew a little bit closer and landed on a, on a dead stick. And, uh, the, the, you know, there's a lot of elephants in this area. So there's a lot of trees that are broken like this. This is not a result of human activity. Um, this is a result of elephant activity. And um, it landed on this thing and, and, and it just stood there and, or sat there. And uh, it was looking at something. You can see it's looking at the ground. I don't know what it was looking at there. Um, and then I took a picture and literally in, an, in, in two seconds, it was gone. And it flew over the car. And it landed on a stick, literally like two meters from, from the window of the car. And I have this pole that, I, that runs across um, between the two handles that on the, on the roof of my car that has a, a, has a piece of uh, rope hanging down from it. So I can take my camera off the, the, um, the, 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 the what you call it, the gimbal that is in the driver's window, flip the, 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 uh, the, the the ring that holds it up upside down and hook it onto the rope and and shoot out the the passenger window. So I just quickly flipped it off, turned it around, took the picture, and it flew off again. So this is how how quickly things can happen when you're birding. But um, and and you know you 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 have to kind of be ready to 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 get those to get those photos. And so many I've missed, you know, because I wasn't ready. The camera was sitting on the on on the seat or you know, the, 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 the a binocular strap was wrapped around the camera or as happened to me once when I had two, um, two uh, um, um, related bird species sitting on the ground together, I picked up the camera, turned around and threw the binoculars out the window at, at the birds. 
because the binocular strap was cut around the lens. So one has to be ready. And now uh, these cuckoos are, are interesting because they belong to the Clamater uh, genus. And, and we all know the, the, the typical um, 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 uh, 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 host, uh, brood parasite cuckoos, the, 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 the common cuckoo, the African cuckoo, and the one that's around uh, at the moment here in South Africa, the Mag Madagascar cuckoo. Um, but this is, these uh, cuckoos belong to a different group, and they actually evolved brood parasitism twice. Um, you know, the uh, brood parasitism actually evolved in this group and the common cuckoos group within the uh, cuckoo family independently. Um, and uh, so that's that's quite interesting. And and these birds, I love cuckoos because there's just some, so many things they can teach you about birds and birding and about evolution and about peculiarities uh, um, that can happen in in uh, during evolution and and, you know, how these, there's so many questions that are that that still have to be answered about these. You know, for example, if you look at this, um, the, the genus that this bird belongs to, you know, there's many several there's several species of of the same genus in in Africa, and they all seem to do similar things. What is how do they separate? How do they you know how did they evolve as separate species? There's just so many things. Um, I, I think Etienne, you you have some stories to tell about this bird as well. Yeah, well, I think the great spotted cuckoo is one of the most fascinating birds. It, it's probably the smartest cuckoo because they parasitize crows and the largest starlings, which I think are yes. well known, big, highly intelligent. And the, it's the big starlings that it was after here, the uh, Meves that, primarily. That's right, group where you've got the Meve starling, that lovely, yeah. beautiful starling with a very long tail. But what yeah. I found fascinating in the semi urban areas in, in the northern part of South Africa is that the great spotted cuckoo seems to have. And this is this is a relatively recent thing. They've they've uh, started parasitizing more and more the common miner, which of course is an invasive alien in our part of the world. And uh, you know, um, birders hate aliens in general. So you know, when you tell this story, a lot of birders sort of lip, lick their lips with glee that this cuckoo has got the better of common <laughs> mine. And it's really quite comical to see uh, a pair of these big cuckoos, they're big birds, um, and a pair of uh, youngsters that have, have been raised by common miners, which are a lot smaller, and they are begging and very demanding um, children. And you know, they almost beat their parents up uh, on an ongoing basis while they're sort of being fed. And it's pretty entertaining to watch and something one should go out you know, and I, I don't know if there's research on this because it's relatively new because there were no common miners in Africa. Um, but reading from what I've read, it started in the 1960s that it was observed for the first time. But now the great spotted cuckoo is really common in, in the semi-urban areas of the Northwest province and parts of Limpopo. Uh, so it's fascinating. Mm. And I guess the common miner is, is just another starling, I suppose, to it. Yeah, and it's a smart bird, as we know, and yet the common yes. this uh, great spotted cuckoo's absolutely, you know, uh, got the upper hand in this relationship. No question. Yeah. That. So I watched this bird for another two days after this. I never got close to it again, but I watched it with binoculars. And it, and and you're right. It has that uh, that kind of sense of when you're looking at it, it looks like it's aware in a way that other birds are not aware. And and starlings have the same look, and and crows, and 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. So you might be right. Yeah. Fascinating stuff, man. You know, hey, Derek, I think this is a lovely picture, but I believe that the one picture that you should have included here was the one of your camera rig in your vehicle. Uh, next time. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do it on the we'll do it on the um, on the photography group in in uh, in um, what is it? Popular pizza? No, not popular. <laughs> We'll get the pitta thing. Right, right. <laughs> Prime, then, precious. Precious. <laughs> precious. No. Okay. Um, as you know, I'm very keen on um, sound recording. Um, I contribute a lot to Zeno Canto, and I have a YouTube channel which has a lot of bird calls. And I was recently extremely lucky to record the experience explosive sound of the Ludwig's Bustard. 
it was the only one on Zeno Panto. Um, it's never been posted there before. Um, this is footage from a trail cam on a farm that we own. And um, after this footage, you will see a distant shot of it's all, all puffed up and its throat all white. And um, that's how it, it seems to, I don't know, Etienne might be able to explain how it makes that popping sound. It, the bustards often have that like popping sound. Um, I don't know if it's the gula or, you know, how it's made, but um, I've got this recording, which I had to amplify. It's very, very difficult to get close to these birds when they are displaying, because if you look at that um, scenery in the background, they often sit on top of a hill and they can see you from a mile off and they stop displaying immediately. So it's almost virtually impossible to get near them to get a clear recording. But I was very lucky this time I was in my car and um, they not as birds aren't as frightened of you in a car. If you open the door and climb out, they flee. But um, it was quite happy that I wasn't, um, you know, too close to it. But um, I've got a parabolic a mark which um, amplifies the sound quite nicely. And um, yeah, you know, for us, you can play this video, and you'll you'll hear that popping sound which they make. There were actually two birds calling. And, and that's it all puffed up displaying for the females. It's a very deep noise. Yes, it's, it's very difficult to actually capture in a recording. It's a very deep um, sound. I, I had to amplify it a lot and remove um, sounds from other Karoo birds um, just to isolate it, those sounds on their own. But there were two birds. It was this one and one much further away. And it's amazing standing on a Karoo plane, hearing them all around you. You don't always see them because they're quite far away. And they say that sound can carry about a kilometer on a Karoo plane. That's incredible, Lynette. It almost it, when um, when I was listening for the sound, I was trying to think of what I was what I was listening for. And it almost sounds like you're tapping the microphone. Yes. yes. It's almost like a bass sound instead mm -hmm. of instead of like a clicking noise or some other kind of noise we usually associate it with birds. It's actually very weird. When you, when I first heard it, I didn't associate it with a bird. I thought it was kudus walking, you know, like there are a lot of stones on the ground. And I think, oh, you know, it's like walking over rocks, but um, it soon, I soon clicked what it was when I saw the bird all puffed up. It, it reminds me of a bittern almost, that kind of mm. call. So for those of you who are not hearing it, I'm just going to come back a little bit. It's a whoop. Mm. I have to listen. It almost um, sounds I've like got, she's tapping yeah, a microphone. I've got, or... this, I've got this recording on Zenocanto, so you can look it up. And I've, it's also on my YouTube channel. So if you go onto YouTube and just type in Lynette Rudman, you should find it. But you'll need um, good speakers, and I think maybe laptop yeah. speakers may not be sufficient to hear yeah. the noise properly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, Krista, you're up. You're Krista, muted. you're on, on mute. <laughs> Got it. Sorry, I was I was typing, so I keep keep muting it. Um. Yeah. So, uh, Etienne actually mentioned earlier, you know, that map locations where we see some of these range maps um, might not necessarily be comprehensive for all species. So I thought that this was an interesting uh, one to include in here as one that I've seen in my local area. Um, so this is a vermilion flycatcher. 
And uh, for us, if you could just go to the next one and see the full um, image here. So this particular individual, uh, you know, I, I think uh, is just is so much fun uh, because I had heard just through the grapevine that this this vermilion flycatcher had been found at a cemetery just north of me, about an hour north of me, every winter for about five winters. And what's in, what's kind of interesting about this is that vermilion flycatchers typically are found in Southern California, Nevada, um, and of course I'm hours north of there. Um, and this, you know, there, there are some flycatchers that will sort of periodically be found in, you know, groups of maybe one or two, just in, as an individual or maybe two individuals together, uh, sort of randomly, but it's not very common. And this individual consistently was coming back with other flycatchers and Phoebes and hanging out at this cemetery adjacent to this orchard where there's tons of insects and other things that they can come and forage on plenty of mature trees uh, also to to hang out in and, and hang out in, in winter time. Um, but you know, if you're looking at a map, uh, and I just thought this was an interesting point to bring up, you know, you might think, okay, I this bird isn't even supposed to be found here. Or if you have a setting listed on your your birding app that limits the the birds that you might be seeing and you're you're putting in you know different characteristics of the bird to try and figure out what you might be looking at uh, this bird might not necessarily pop up because it the range map of where it's typically found uh, wouldn't necessarily overlap but uh, you know birds don't necessarily subscribe to these maps that we created right so um, being able to use that sort of deduction that okay all these other characteristics match up. Um, sometimes we can't always take um, the range maps to sort of face value, but um, I just thought that that was uh, something interesting to point out that, you know, sometimes we can, when we're, when we're out and about at different times of year, you know, we're going to be seeing birds that we wouldn't necessarily think that we would uh, find in a particular location. And these birds are, as you can see, they're really just, they're so gorgeous and they're a lot of fun to watch. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, I went up to this cemetery to, to take a look at it. And um, it, although, you know, cemetery, I don't know how many uh, of you all have gone birding at cemeteries before. If you have, uh, let me know, let us know in the chat. But they're, you know, they, they might seem like unusual locations as long as they're public spaces and, you know, you're respectful when you're visiting that location. There's such great places to go birding. Um, and they're often, you know, these, these green spaces that are maintained. Some of the older ones have older trees and plants and things like that, that when birds are flying over for migration, or you know they're looking for a spot to overwinter can just be so um, ben, you know beneficial for them. They're thinking, okay, great, this is a nice little stopover site for me, uh, and they're really cool spots to go and and visit. So if you have a cemetery that's you know public cemetery in your area that you haven't been to, um, definitely definitely check it out because you can find some really cool really cool birds. Elizabeth says that you can see some owls in her cemetery, so. There you go. We might be yeah really because of that because they have big old trees. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's and and also not disturbed too much. Right. Not tons of people necessarily coming in and out all the time. And cemeteries and sewage ponds. Sewage ponds. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. All the places Buddhists go, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so uh, Faraz, I think you're up next. I, I, yeah. I wanted to just take stock here. We, we, we've actually gone out of over time, time yeah. a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we can do one of two things. We can, we can, we can finish up with you on on the next round. Or we, if people are really uh, keen, we can carry on and 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 do the the last uh, three sets. Well, let us know in the chat. So I'll just um, talk about my. Um, one of my experiences here, um, and, it, and, it, and it, it involves not one but two species of birds, and uh, but I would have you know that they they were formerly a single species. So technically, yeah, they were they were just one species at one point in time, but now 
they are two. So I'm going to ask you if you can spot the difference. If you can spot the difference, let, let us know in the chat. Um, one of them on the left is a lined seed eater, and the one on the right is a lessons seed eater. So maybe I can go one forward and show you a different view. And it, it might be a little bit easier to see what's the difference. So the one on the left is a lined seed eater and the one on the right is the lessons, right? And the lined seed eater, as Derek was indicating, has that crown stripe, white crown stripe. And the lessons on the right-hand side is not does not have that. And some uh, some lesson seed eaters also have a, a lot of uh, like mottle, mottling on the on the chest area. Um, but otherwise they are they're two very similar boots. And um, what's what also happened with them is that they have they have both also suffered the same kind of fate here in Trinidad and Tobago, where people trap them for um, cage boots because they have a wonderful uh, melodious song. And uh, so they've been, they used to breed here all the time, but now they're just Austral migrants. So they come up here from South America um, every now and again. And it's been maybe about, could be eight, eight or nine years since I had seen um, either of these two species and they, we did not actually have many reports of them over the years. From since then to now, there may have been a handful of reports, if any. Um, and the first time I saw Lion City to actually, um, there were also bird trappers that came because they heard the birds singing and they came with their cages and, and, and whatnot. But yeah, don't worry, I chased them off. Um, that was back in maybe 2013 or 2014 or something, maybe even earlier. Um, but late last year, there was a single spot very close to where I live, where both of these species showed up. So the lion seed eater um, showed up first, and everyone was like, wow, lion seed eater, and we went down there, and it was just about maybe 20 minutes from where I live. So I went there pretty often, photographed them a couple of times, and maybe just as the lion seed eaters were, were leaving, so there were five of them, there were a few females as well, I would not show you the females because I don't want to be responsible for giving anyone a headache to separate these female seed eaters. They're incredibly similar. But yeah. Um, but yeah, the, then we got like maybe a three uh, lesson seed eaters show up in the literally the same spot, in the same wetland, in the same patch. So you can see they're both perched on the, on the same kind of vegetation. It's just a different, different day and uh, so different lighting conditions and so on but yeah it was just um it was incredible after not having seen them for for so many years to see both species in a matter of a couple of weeks in literally the same spot that was just about 20 minutes from from uh from where i live so yeah so with that um yeah i i think the consensus is on the chat that we're gonna go on and uh and finish up quickly yeah. So okay, Eric, over to okay. you. Okay. So, so, so this is um, and this is another um, unusual bird, and this is from Northern Kruger, and this is also a tribute to to one of the park attendants from from Kruger, um, uh, uh, named Frank Mabasa, who ran the picnic site at uh, at Pafuri for many years, and unfortunately. Um, I think about three or four years ago, he passed away. Um, but he introduced me to and showed me how to find this bird. And it's a really interesting bird that um, that uh, makes its nest in these uh, lala uh, or vegetable ivory palms, uh, which are these big palm trees that you find uh, sort of throughout. Um, I guess they, they go all the way up into sub-Saharan Africa. But they're very common in 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 uh, the northern parts of South Africa, Botswana, um, and, and and so on. And uh, you know the elephants eat the seeds, eat the fruit, and uh, and uh, partially digest the seeds, but don't completely digest them. 
and you can actually see that in 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 parts of uh, Botswana where the where the elephant migration routes are, and uh, these trees just grow in a in a line with following the the elephant poop. Um, but in 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 South Africa, this uh, these palms are 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 harvested. Uh, the big trees are often cut down, and and but they do sucker from the base, and so you get around the base of these big trees, you get. Uh, what you can see in the middle here is, uh, uh, you know, the suckered uh, palms that are that are growing up from the base, and and uh, often you only get the suckers. You don't actually get the the tall palms because as soon as they grow up, somebody cuts them for something. Um, now in Kruger Park, of course, the that would be mostly the elephants, um, and they will knock the tree the palm over to get the nuts as well, um, because it takes two years for the for the nuts to get ripe. Um, and uh, they'll knock the trees down to get the, the nuts as, the, as elephants are prone to do. So uh, next slide. So when you when you uh, when you go and and you look closely at these these clumps of palms in in northern in the northern Kruger, you often see this little bird, and and this is the uh, lemon-breasted canary. And the interesting thing about the lemon-breasted canary is that it's it's one of a few birds that are hyper specialized uh, such a high degree of specialization is not that common in birds i think um this this bird is only found associated with the lala palm and, and it only nests in the in the fronts of the palm and when the and you can you can side the road right here when you're looking down at the at where these uh, where this uh, these palms are you can actually see the new leaves coming up and they form a little shape like that um and the uh, these canaries go in and they nest in there, and uh, they're, they're such beautiful birds. I, I just think they're uh, one of my favorites. Uh, uh, I mean, they're my, definitely my favorite canary and one of my favorite birds. And they're just bizarre because they they so totally specialized on 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 making their lives around this this palm, um, and they don't, as far as I know, and Etienne, you might be able to uh, shed some light on this. They don't occur everywhere the palm occurs. Um, they have a much more restricted distribution than the palm, and they're also a little bit nomadic. I think when when it's not breeding season, so you don't always find them when you find when you find the palms. But if it rains and there's good rains uh, in the northern Kruger, as there is this year where I am now, and all around me, it's 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 everything is green and lush. Um, um, you get these birds, uh, but I've been looking for them now for four years, and this is the first time that I found a good population of them in this spot. And I've gone to this spot many times uh, over, over the four years. Um, and, and I spent um, probably all, all total in my, in my five days at, uh, in, the, in that part of the Northern Kruger, I think I, I spent about 10 hours watching this, this bird, these birds um, just parked on the side of the road. People would come along and say, what do you see? What do you see? <laughs> You know, as they do in the in the national park, they're expecting you to see a lion. No, it's a canary. Oh, okay. And you can see there's one bringing in some uh, nesting material, and down in the I couldn't get a picture of it. There's just no way for me to get the angle. There was a big tree beside the road, and I just couldn't get. And you're not you can't get out of the car there because it's Kruger Park, right? But down in there is where the birds were uh, making a nest. So yeah, they're they're highly specialized, and and it's unusual for birds because you know specialization is 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 a good way to get away from uh, from a threatening situation, uh, but it's also highly risky because if you are specialized, and conditions change, uh, you can go extinct quite quickly. And this is, I think, the the challenge that this bird is facing now is that the the habitat is uh, is is threatened. Um, as these palms get, get cut down and used and, and, and harvested and the, you know, even the, 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 the heart of palm is actually extracted from the, from the, from the center of the, of the, of the plant as well. So even the place where they nest is, is dug out and, and used. Yeah. If I can come in and just um, interject yes. with the, in Mozambique in particular, this lala, the lala palm is actually very widespread. So in Southern Africa, but just, so viewers know the the, the lemon-breasted canary has got a very restricted range. It's only found in Southeast Africa and very very small area, you know, in the bigger perspective. 
But uh, yeah. something that's taken, taken hold in a lot of these areas is palm wine. So they extract the sap yeah. from the palms, use them for use it to make alcohol, and that seems to have really been on the increase. And what what I've noticed in in Mozambique, which is probably where the biggest population of these canaries is, is that the palms are really being hammered by the palm wine, and there are no leaves. And as you say, what you say, Derek, is absolutely true. You you will never find a lemon breasted canary if there aren't lala palms around. So really, really specialized uh, bird. And what's interesting is in, down in KZN, where it's the only other place I've seen them, um, they've been up in the, in the only, I've only seen them up in the high palms, even though there's lots of these clusters of suckers around. Um, you all, like if you go to Bonamanzi, for example, you don't find them. There's lala palms all over, but you only find them up in the high ones. Whereas in Kruger, you don't see them up in the high ones. You only find them in the, in the suckers. Um, David is asking if there's any effort on the way to protect the palms. Um, not as far as I know in, in, in Mozambique. I mean, you know, most of the areas where these birds occur are not protected areas. Uh, they're not protected mm -hmm. at all. And you have, you know, local people uh, doing, um, you know, subsistence agriculture over vast areas. So as far as I know, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing like that. Yeah, uh, and you never find them in large numbers either. I mean, this is the largest number uh, that I've seen. Um, and I think there probably were maybe 30 to 50 birds in this area, which is, uh, you know, that's extremely high numbers for this bird. Interesting. Okay, so just moving on here. Bennett, this is up to you. Okay. Um, this was a really magical experience. I was in the mountain zebra park um, near Crada. It was a sweltering hot day. I was recording bird calls. So I had all four windows open, the front ones and the back ones. And um, I suddenly realized that um, the greatest trout swallows were very interested in my car. I've often had um, birds land on top of my car. I've had like mouse birds and that, and you can hear them. But suddenly one flew in and out the next uh, window. And then um, you'll see from this video what happened. It was, I was absolutely gobsmacked. Luckily, I had my video camera with me and I just stood, I sat dead still in the driver's seat. And you will see now, um, this video was actually 10 minutes long. It's on my YouTube channel, but I've um, edited it to about one and a half minutes. But you will, it's incredible what happened. I couldn't believe what was occurring. It was almost like a spiritual experience for me that a pair of greatest striped swallows were so confiding in me and, and not afraid of me at all. I mean, I was hardly moving, but they, they knew I was there. So, yeah, enjoy the video. I've added um, some commentary. Yeah. At first, they were just flying in one window and out the other. First, the female got braver and perched on the back seat, and then the male followed her. Finally, they both settled on the back seat and started singing. And then one flew and sat on the headrest of the passenger seat right next to me. This pair of greatest striped swallows was clearly looking for a nice, warm, cozy place to build their mud nest. You can see that gorgeous forked tail, yes. too. 
Oh, that's the male with the long streamers. Watching these birds so at peace in my presence and not even worried about me being there. Unfortunately, I had to drive off after about 10 minutes um, and they fled. I was going to say, Lynette, in the, in the interest of bird conservation, you should have left your car there and walked home. <laughs> um, you are aware that there are quite a few lions in that park. <laughs> and cheetahs. Wow, that's incredible. They're beautiful. That's birds pretty cool. Yeah, that was so cool. And I was so glad to have captured it on video. Because people would not have believed me if I told them what had happened. They would have thought I was lying. Lynette, we have to compliment you for being extremely patient and you're obviously very quiet when, you, when you're out birding. So I'm extremely quiet. I bird alone and I don't move much. And I, I'm very lucky that I get to see birds close up because they're quite confiding. If you don't move and you don't make a noise, you don't um, wave your arms around. It's amazing. I enjoy it. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Okay, so Krista, here's your two, and then I got one more, and then we we call it a wrap. Yeah, so I'll just uh, I'll just chat about this really quick. Um, you know, I I had to go visit Florida earlier in December, and you know, often when when Florida is an amazing place to go birding pretty much any time of year, but um, in the winter it's also really fabulous because. Um, it's a good overwintering site for a lot of birds. And the Everglades is one of the more common places that people think of to go birding. And it is a fantastic location, but uh, I didn't end up getting down there. I was at Ding Darling, which is a small national wildlife refuge off of Sanibel Island on the west part of, of Florida on the Gulf side. And um, they have these beautiful uh, mangrove trees and, and small mangrove forests. Um, and I had actually gone in hopes of seeing mangrove cuckoo, which are incredibly uh, elusive and really difficult to find. Um, and as we know, sometimes when we go out birding, we don't always end up getting the opportunity to see the birds we hope to see or think we're gonna see um, or our target species. But um, for us, if you could go to the next one, I was really, um, uh, excited because thank you. So the, the picture's a little bit blurry because I, I took this through my binoculars. I was really excited because I got to see an Anhinga and, you know, living out here in California, we don't get these birds here. Um, they're just these gorgeous water birds that are sort of similar, uh, similarly related to cormorants. And they're found in the Southeast US and Central and South America. Um, but, you know, they're super, um, super interesting birds just to sort of watch and it, we were able to sort of just look at it for a little while and enjoy its behavior and a lot of times these birds aren't making a ton of noise and I didn't get a recording, uh, Lynette, if you were with me, I would have been able to get something great, I'm sure, but um, they, you know, they make these sort of croaking noises similar to a frog. So initially when I was hearing this noise, I wasn't attributing it to the Anhinga, but uh, it started sort of croaking almost. And that just being able to stop for a little while and hang out on this boardwalk and, and watch this bird, you know, it was really quiet, um, uh, make these noises and sort of be able to attribute those noises now to this bird now that I'm just sort of stopping and taking it all in and, and being able to take the time to watch it was really, really wonderful. Um, and I wanted to point out the behavior too that it's exhibiting here, this sort of sunning behavior is really common uh, to see in anhingas and, and cormorants after they've been swimming around uh, looking for look, looking for food. They'll go up onto a branch or some other kind of perch and stretch their wings out like this in an effort to dry their dry their wings off. Sometimes you'll see other bird species doing this to get rid of parasites. Um, it's, so this sunning mechanism, the heat um, can also help with um, eliminating parasites in the in the feathers. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out, I don't need to go into it in too much more detail than that either, but, um, you know, even though sometimes you might go 
somewhere and hope to see one particular individual you can stumble upon others that you know as Lynette was talking about earlier at the beginning you hope to see one bird sometimes and as you hang out there sometimes another one will come along that um you know you weren't expecting either so I was glad to be able to spend some time with this bird that I don't get to see very often here absolutely um here we call them snake bird because when they're in the water their, their, their neck and their head is just above the water. So it just looks like a little um, serpentine kind of creature. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, all right, so it's just me. It's just me here. Um, all right, so um, I've got one more for you guys. And this is a sighting that I, that was um, on the first day that I went birding for 2022, um, which was the 2nd of January. And this, this is a rufescent tiger heron, and you can see why it gets the name tiger heron. It's got this kind of orange and black um, sort of plumage, and that's it's it's actually why um, you know if you see the if you see the the adult because this is a juvenile. If you see the adult, it doesn't look anything like any kind of tiger. So. Now, for, for many years, we've had one species here, which is rufescent tiger heron. And recently we've been getting some sightings of another species called the fasciated tiger heron. And the adults look very, very different, but the juveniles look incredibly similar. So much so that um, oftentimes juveniles will go um, unidentified in the field just just we just know that hey there's a, a juvenile tiger heron there and they're sometimes separated by habitat but we've gotten fasciated in in this kind of habitat as well in trinidad maybe just uh, last year um but yeah this was the first time i've seen a a, a juvenile and it, it gave us a lot of trouble to identify it properly and uh, even up to today we're just like uh, myself and my wife were just looking at it and looking at the pictures and I, I, you know just investigating the shape of the bill and uh, yeah the consensus is that it is a, a rufescent tiger heron um, and yeah, only the second time I've seen this species the only other time that I saw one was an adult and this was um, seven years ago and you can see the, ruf the rufous kind of color um, and yeah, so very special bird. It's a very secretive bird. Um, but yes, uh, that was that was my that's my final holiday birding story for you guys. So what I'll do is that I'll stop my share right now, and uh, um, just invite everyone to, if you have any questions about what we spoke about or anything like that, just. Um, just let us know. Let us know in the chat. And I've allowed people to turn on video and... Oh, no, I've, I've turned off that ability. Sorry. Let me try that again. <laughs> uh, if you want to start your video and, or, or uh, turn on your microphone and, and speak rather than type in the chat, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, feel free. Feel free. Um, you know, we went over over the time today um, with with your consent. Of course, we asked you if um, if we'd be allowed, you know, um, but yes, usually we're going to be down to one hour or in 15 minutes. As best uh, as I possible. could just I just I just wanted to comment. I think it's in relation to uh, Christus uh, uh, input on the Anhingas of because, of course, Part of the, the 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 beauty of a webinar like this is we're all from different parts of the world and we spread around the globe. And when you hear about the Anhinga, we think of the African data and the Oriental data and the Australasian Anhinga and so on. And, and here you have a bird that's actually global and there's similar species. And I wonder if the next one shouldn't be where we actually take a bird and we look at the different forms around the world and how they differ and how they, you know, and get people from different continents and places to, to reflect on those those birds because i think it's one of the the great things that binds birders from across the planet we as a birding community are bound together yeah. a because birds travel but b because so many of our birds have 
um, you know, similar species in different parts of the globe. Yeah, yeah Etienne, I totally agree. And uh, I think that that's, that's a really good point to one of the things that I often talk about in, you know, looking at family groups and, and trying to identify birds in general is looking at those specific characteristics that make all these birds, no matter where you go in the world, similarly related. And, you know, as with the anhingos and the darters and thrushes, you know, where they have these really similar behaviors and they look really similar, but they're found all over the globe, even though they're different species. Um, that's sort of one of those key things about even, you know, identifying what kind of bird you're looking at, no matter where you are, even if it's not the same species you might be used to in, in your home location and your usual spot. For sure. For sure, indeed. Um, let's see, any questions in the chat? Hey folks, um, I, I actually have to run because I have another meeting coming up now, but you all can um, continue. I'm just going to step out. I, I think uh, for us, we've, uh, we've taken people's time up in, enough the, this evening, today, this morning, whatever time it is where you are. So let's just thank everybody for, for coming. And uh, we hope that we'll bring you some more opportunities to learn the birds during the course of the year. Of course. Thanks to everyone, everyone who spoke and everyone who came. And we'll Thank see you all again. Everyone. Thanks. Thanks to Faraz and Derek for, for running the show. It was really great. It was great fun. Hope to be back. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us, everyone.